I am Kay Firth Butterfield. I am head of artificial intelligence at the World Economic Forum. You are, we are welcoming you to the World Economic Forum's offices in San Francisco. Um, I am also privileged to be a member of the board of Earth Species, so it's wonderful to have you all here today. I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do here at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, most of you will know us for Davos, but uh, the work that we do here is really around, thing, in my case, thinking about uh, responsible AI and how it can be applied in many great ways, uh, for example, in climate, and also to keep an eye on the ethical challenges of AI as well. What we are all here to do is because we share a common interest in listening to the other species with which we share this planet. Uh, so we want to understand better those other species. We want to learn how to coexist better with them. And you never know, maybe we can uh, affect environmental policy that actually um, allows us to co coexist better. So it's a very current topic. Um, you've probably read about this interspecies communication um, in the press recently. And also um, we will on our panel, which is coming up later, be introducing you to Professor Karen Baker, who has just written a book on the topic. And that'll be an exciting discussion for us to have. And so, you know, what you're going to what we're going to think about on the panel tonight is where's the technology going? Why is that important? And also have a conversation about that other downside piece. Are there any ethical issues that we should be scanning the horizon for in this area? But we just don't want to be talking at you. We want this to be a really interactive evening. So we've left a lot of um, space for questions and answers and discussion post our panel. I'll introduce you to the panel in, uh, later on. But now I want to introduce you to Aza Raskin. I'll try to move fairly quickly through this, um, but also feel free to ask questions. And the thing I think is really exciting is to give this as a, a background so that uh, Karen and Ari uh, can also be up here and we can, we can talk together. So Earth Species Project, like, it seems sort of crazy to get to say this, but we're, we're working to decode non-human communication. That is to say, can we talk to animals? Um, and we get to work on this now, and it, it's credible, and the, the goal is to say, you know, can we unlock communication to transform our relationship with the rest of nature? And I want to start with this audio. Does anyone know, who's not on our team, <laughs> what animal makes this sound? I heard krill, and which it's not, and whales, which it's not. Also not beluga, also not a bird. It is, yes, seals. It's one of these guys, <laughs> right? That was this guy's mating call. So, um, so if you hear that and you get excited, now you know where to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what I love starting here is like the sounds of the natural world are so diverse but we are mostly unaware of them. Um, Earth species, the original idea for it, came uh, in 2013 um, from an NPR piece about these guys, gelata monkeys. Um, and the researcher who's on NPR talking about them said, you know, they have one of the largest vocabularies of any primate, except for humans, they swear that the animals talk about them behind their backs, uh, which they probably are. Uh, and they sound a little bit like women and children babbling. 
and at the point of thinking about this, um, like there's no one really working on how do you apply machine learning to decoding an animal language. And then uh, Britt, who uh, is like the, the person that started uh, Earth Species with co-founded in 2017, when we started, there were very few people thinking about this. Um, and that's really changed uh, from 2017 to 2022. So you know, now there's this incredible book, How to Speak Well, by Tom Mustel, which sort of follows along this adventure. Um, Karen's book, which is exceptional and beautiful, um, poetic as well as scientific. And we now get to work with a whole slew of partners. And actually, I think Graham is sitting here, who's both at Internet Archive and also the Interspecies Internet. Um, and so it's gone, and then you know, slew of press. So it's gone from a, like a, an idea in the mind to something where there's an entire field that's now working on it, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and if there's one concept I want you guys to hold in the back of your minds for this, uh, for this talk is that I, our ability to understand is limited by our ability to perceive. And what does AI do? It is opening the aperture of human imagination and the human senses to let us perceive much more. And in so doing, it'll let us understand a whole bunch more. Karen, I think, will give a whole bunch more of these kinds of examples. But I want to start with just a couple of my favorites for opening the aperture of what we even think is possible. So University of Tel Aviv, 2019, is an incredible study on primrose flowers. And they asked this question, do you think, like nature abhors a vacuum, do you think a flower can hear the sound of an approaching bee? And so they played different sounds to a primrose flower. They played like traffic noise, uh, bat noise, and pollinator noise, bee noise. And only when they played bee noise did the flower respond. And it produced more and sweeter nectar in just a couple seconds. Right? So the flower hears the bee coming and gets excited. It's like, here, come to me. I, I think that's just amazing. And actually, they tried the inverse, same lab. They stressed out uh, tobacco and tomato plants, so dehydrated them, like cut them. And it turns out they emit sound. Um, and not softly. They'll emit sound in proportion to how much they are stressed at the sound of human speaking. It's just up at 50 or 60 kilohertz, so we can't hear it. And so here we go. We have plants that can hear and plants that are you know, speaking, that are emitting sound. And we were completely unaware of it until 2019. Like The world is awash in communication. And I think if we move forward and look back in time, we will be astounded at how static we thought the world was. Just another one, because I, I can't help it. There's this amazing plant called the Bukila trifiliolata. It's a, it's a vine. Um, and it does the most amazing thing. You put it on other plants, and it will mimic their leaves. Pretty amazing. Um, and so biologists, uh, botanists, were like, well, wh how, how is it doing this? Well, it's probably detecting the chemical signatures of the other plants. Um, and that's how it's like knowing what leaves to make. And so they tried this great experiment in 2020 where they tried growing this vine on artificial plants. And it still was able to mimic the leaves. Right? And so honestly, there is, this is a current mystery. The current best thought is that they use oscilletti, which is a very fancy way of saying eyes, that they are seeing the plant and changing. So again. We go forward, we look back, and we realize how little we actually knew. We're looking for animal language, because we think it's, a, one, awesome, and two, a really big lever for maybe changing human culture and driving conservation. But is there a there there? And this is a fascinating study um, from University of Hawaii in 1994, where they taught dolphins two gestures. And the first gesture was, do something you have not done before. That is, innovate. And think about it, that's a pretty complex thing to be able to communicate, because you and to do, right? To be able to innovate, you have to remember all the things you've done before that session, understand the concept of negation, not one of those things, and then invent something that isn't one of those things. And yet dolphins do it. And then they teach a second gesture, do something together. And they say to the dolphins, in a pair, do something you haven't done before together. And the dolphins go down, exchange some kind of information, they come up and they do the same thing they haven't done before at the same time. 
you're like, Occam's razor. It doesn't prove that there's language, but you're like, it's sort of the simplest explanation. <laughs> and that leads to the question, OK, maybe there is a there there. How would you go about transiting a language without a Rosetta Stone? Well, if you want to understand AI, I think there's like one concept, again, to hold in your mind that's really explanatory. And that is AI turns semantic relationships into geometric relationships. This is English. This is the top 10,000 most spoken words in English. Um, it's actually supposed to be in like 300 dimensions. We project it down to three dimensions because I can't think in 300 dimensions. Uh, every star in this galaxy is a word. And words that share a semantic relationship share a geometric relationship. So an example of this might be, you know, smelly is to malodorous as book is to tone because Malodorous is sort of the pretentious way of saying smelly. <laughs> and so if you take that, you do malodorous minus smelly, gives you pretentiousness as a relationship. You add pretentiousness to clever and illegal adroit. Um, it's, it's pretty wild to play with these spaces. And so if you think then about, like, how do you end up with a shape that represents a language? If you think about a concept like dog, well, it has relationship to friend, and to guardian, and to man, and to cat, and to wolf, and to fur. And it fixes it in a point in space. And if you sort of solve the massive multidimensional Sudoku puzzle of every concept to every other concept and the relationships, out pops this rigid structure. And the question then researchers had, and why we started our species in 2017, is if you have the shape which is German and the shape which is English, they can't possibly be similar shapes, can they? And linguists would say, well, they have a different history, different cosmology, different way of relating to the world. So it should be a different shape. And yet, when the machine learners tried it, it turned out that they fit. And it wasn't just English and German, which share a root. It was languages like Japanese, and Esperanto, and Finnish, and Turkish, and Aramaic. And it's not like they all have the same shape, and more distant languages have more unrelated shapes. And yet, there was a way that you could align them onto all on top of each other. And in so doing, the point which is dog ends up in the same spot in both. I just think this is so profoundly beautiful that you know, in a time of such a deep division, there is this hidden underlying structure that unites us all. And so our thought was, and actually, you know, this is not the way now modern, modern, I don't know what the right terms for these things are, ultra modern machine learning does translation. But this is the core concept, I think, that holds in your head for why this thing works. And our thought was, well, can we apply this then to animal communication? If we build this shape for the way animals communicate, what part fits into the universal human meaning shape? And if it does, then we should be able to do direct translation to the human experience. And there should be some part where their experience of the world is so different, we can't translate, but we can see that there's something there. And I still don't know which one is going to be more fascinating the parts that we can directly translate into the human experience or the parts we have no idea what it is, right? And those are going to be the things that are outside of the aperture of the human imagination, right? Whales and dolphins have cultures that have been passed down vocally for 34 million years. Humans, only for maximally 300,000 years. Just imagine what they might know. And why do we think there might be an overlap? Well, I'll just give two examples. This is the, uh, the mirror test. I don't know how many of you guys are aware of it. But the idea is you show an animal a mirror. Often you will like paint a uh, dot on them. And when they look in the mirror, they see themselves. They see the dot that they couldn't see before, and they try to get it off. This dolphin is looking at its abs, which I think is a relatively universal human experience when you get to a mirror. <laughs> um, but this shows a kind of self-awareness, right? Like you have to have self-awareness. That's a deep and profound experience that they may well communicate about. So that part of the shape might be shared. Let me give another example. This is a, um, a lemur uh, taking a hit off of a centipede. They do this, and they get high. They go into this trance-like state. Um, they get super happy. Uh, it turns out dolphins do the same thing, um, but with pufferfish. They will inflate a pufferfish in a group and then like pass it around to get high, um, <laughs> which is the ultimate of puff, puff, pass. Um, <laughs> so elevated states of consciousness and seeking that is another thing that is shared across um, a wide variety of species. 
So that's something where we'd expect some kind of fit. But OK, how do we go about building this shape? And it turns out it's really hard. Getting the data is hard. That's why we have like, such a long list of partnerships. Like Ari, who's here, will talk about how hard it actually is to go out into the field. Like, this takes like, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, turns out whales don't exactly just want to like, stick around and like, help you. Um, and so you know, as we started to dive into it, we realized there, there were a lot of really, really hard problems we're going to have to solve before we could start ans asking these kinds of questions. So here, here's another question. What animal makes this sound? <laughs> Correct. You must live in San Francisco. <laughs> Anyone else want to guess? Close. That's awesome. It is about cocktail parties. That is true. This is the beluga. This is a couple of belugas communicating. And to me, it sounds like an alien modem. Um, and it turns out dolphins have names that they call each other by. Uh, Valeria Vergara, Dr. Valeria Vergara, who's doing research on belugas, is discovering that belugas also have names they call each other by, but they're broadband packets. Um, wouldn't it be nice, though, to know which beluga was speaking? You sort of want to separate them out into their own individual tracks. Valeria, for her research, had to throw away 97% of her data because the animals were overlapping, and she couldn't tell who was speaking. And like 97%, like that's like there is a next frontier there. So actually, one of our first papers was trying to tackle this particular problem. So this is. Two dogs barking, and we learned how to separate them using AI. And right now, it works on lab-like data. But where we're going is to try to get it to work more on wild data. But to do that, we're starting to work on this new trend in machine learning. You guys have heard of GPT or GPT-3 or OPT um, or CLIP or any of these sort of like new big language models. These things are foundation models. And what's really interesting about these foundation models is that in, say, understanding human language, in the last four years, is it essentially 0% of papers were using these things four years ago. And now 90% of research is based on these sort of new models. They're like the new telescope. And in the non-human domain, it's still 0%. Right? So there's this huge opportunity where there's like this novel catalytic technology that's also been de-risked, because it works in the human domain, and now it just has to be brought to the non-human domain. And so that's sort of really our roadmap right now, is that we are working with all of our partners, collecting data, aggregating data, building these foundational models and the benchmarks that are required to know whether you're getting better, so we can build these kinds of semantic representations um, to understand uh, language, which are the shapes of language, and the things that I haven't talked about but are sort of next to them, so that we can work on these kinds of translations and eventually get to communicate. So we actually just published, um, the 21st of October, our first big paper on building a benchmark so that you can tell across many different tasks how well these models are doing, which really paves the way for the next paper, which will be out uh, in the next, I think, couple of weeks, on our first sort of foundation models. OK, so I've talked about the ability to translate between human languages. Um, but maybe that just works because we all share the same you know, anatomy, physiology. Um, but actually, there's something deeper going on. So I want to talk a little bit about multimodal translation. Um, have you guys seen like, all of the AI generative art that's been happening recently? How does that work? Dolly, exactly. Um, here's how to think about it. So you can build the shape for a language. But you can also build a shape for images, because it's just the relationship between things. You then look over the internet to find all of the images and caption pairs, and that learns to associate languages and images. And so now I can say something like portrait of Chile as a person, find the point in language space, translate over to the point in image space, and say, computer, generate me the image that goes there. There's a real example. So I'll just give one example here, Google Soup. Ask the AI to generate the image that goes with Google Soup. 
And what's really cool about this, right, is like there's a deep amount of semantic understanding. It knows enough to get the Google mascot, fine. It knows that soup is hot and plastic melts in soup. So the mascot is melting. And then there's this incredible visual pun of the yellow of the mascot is also the yellow of corn. Right? There's a lot that it knows. This was my face when I first saw this. <laughs> and so, OK, so this is multimodal translation. You can translate between two very different sense modalities. And this makes us believe that this kind of thing can work across species as well. So what kind of data do we work with? This is actually Ari um, in Antarctica uh, tagging whales. And you can see that the data that comes off of it is uh, how the animals move, kinematics. You get visuals, so you get video, and you get audio. So you can start to translate between these. Um, one of, we actually uh, just were awarded one of the National Geographic Explorers <laughs> Awards. And um, the project is led by Benjamin Hoffman, who is working on turning all of that like physical motion data into meaning. Like, what are, what are their behaviors? How do you categorize it? And the reason why I want to do that, um, in part, is because this lets you start doing really interesting things. Like say, OK, given this motion, what sound goes with it? So you could imagine saying, we have two elephants coming together. You model that, and you say, AI, generate me the audio. That is the sound of two uh, elephants coming together. And that'll give you the, the affiliate calls, the contact calls, how they say their name. Um, or you might say, OK, we want to like, intervene with ship strikes hitting whales. Could it be possible to say to a whale, like, dive? And we would then say, what would you say to have a whale dive? And it will generate the audio for that. Now, before saying, that, like, ooh, we should just go do that, it comes with a lot of really complex ethical issues. Are we forcing the animal to dive, and it's missing food or expending energy that it can't afford? Um, it's just like one of the kinds of things that, that we might run into there. Um, so, and this is sort of the area that I'm really interested in exploring today. Um, I just want to show one more video. And this is with another partner of ours, Michelle Fournay. Uh, this is from her very recent documentary uh, called Fathom on Apple Television about her experiments that we're starting to work with her on. Oldest cultures are not human. They're from the ocean. 40 million years ago, before we walked upright, before we sparked fire, whales evolved to build relationships in the dark. I'm trying to start a conversation is the most basic way you can say it. I'm trying to put a speaker in the ocean and talk to a whale and hope it talks back. Ready to play that? If this work is successful, it will be the first experiment where we have engaged in a dialogue with a humpback whale. The punchline um, is that it works. She's saying hello to the whales, which sounds like <laughs> Um, and it also apparently encodes their name, and they respond back. The next question is, can we say something more complex than just recording something and playing it back? So one of our researchers, uh, Jen Yu, has been working on building language models directly on top of audio. Um, and so this is an example of that. This is a humpback contact call, that hello, maybe with name, a real one, and then two synthetic ones. So we're just at the beginning of this. Um, and a technology that came out in the last, essentially, month um, is, and this one comes from Google, um, who's actually donating a whole, a whole bunch of compute to be able to build these kinds of models to Earth species. But this is an audio language model. And here, you're going to see the demo of being given just three seconds of anyone's voice. And it can then continue that voice with the same prosody, the same diction, um, the same semantics. And then it'll do the same thing with a piano. So here's an example. Most impressions of people are, in nine cases out of 10, mere spectacle reflections of the actuality Prompt. of things. Prompt. Made up. But they're impressions of something different and more. Right? Or how about piano? Prompt. Made up. So what does this mean? 
This means in our domain, at some point, 12, 24, 36 months, we're going to be able to do this for animal vocalizations. Right? And so just like I can build a chatbot in Chinese without needing to understand Chinese that still convince a Chinese speaker, we will likely, we haven't done it yet, be able to sort of pass the dolphin Turing test or the whale Turing test or the tool using crow Turing test. And it's really exciting because that means there is a kind of first contact or, or something that's about to happen, but not in the way I think we originally expected where we decode first and then begin to communicate, but there will be this really surprising ability to communicate before we understand. And so obviously there's some deep ethical issues here, as well as some really exciting opportunities. So one of our partners, Christian Roots, um, who works with Tools and Crows, sort of commented um, on a roadmap and said, hey, you know, humpback whales, their song, it can go viral. Um, so a song sung off the coast of Australia might get picked up and sung you know, within a year across much of the population. Um, so if we're not careful, we may have just invented like a CRISPR of culture and messed up a, or intervened in a 34 million year old culture. And so I think now is the right time to start thinking about when you invent a new technology, you invent a new responsibility. Like, What are the responsibilities for acting with a duty of care for the natural world? And in some ways, that's the whole point of Earth Species in the first place, is how do we shift our relationship with the rest of nature? So I think it's a really exciting time to have this kind of conversation because you know, I, I think we think of AI as the invention of modern optics. It's like the telescope in the sense that before, when we invented the telescope, we looked out into the universe and discovered Earth was not the center. And here the opportunity that we get to look out at the patterns of the universe and discover that maybe humanity is not the center of the universe. Aza, thank you so much. You can see why at Earth Species we're so passionate about this. And um, Aza's talk is only the beginning of our evening. So can I invite Aza, Ari, and Karen to join me on the stage, please? So forgive me for reading their bios, but their bios are so amazing that I don't want to make a, make a mess of it. And I want you to hear all of it really clearly. So Dr. Karen Baker is a Canadian author, researcher, and tech entrepreneur known for her work on digital transformation, environmental governance, and sustainability. She's a professor at the University of British Columbia and VP Strategy for Ripen, a future of work company. She is also a Rhodes Scholar with a PhD from Oxford and is currently on sabbatical leave at Harvard as a Radcliffe Institute for um, Advanced Study Fellow. She is the recipient of numerous awards, too, men too many to mention here, um, and if all that, all that wasn't enough, she has a new book that has just been published by Princeton University Press, The Sounds of Life, How Digital Technology is Bringing Us Closer to the World of Animals and Plants. That will be the NPR Science Friday Book Club of the Month in November. So you'll all be able to listen to it. <laughs> And it was just chosen as one of Malcolm Gladwell's next Big Ideas nominees for October. So I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this in the course of our discussion. So now moving to Dr. Ari Friedlander. He is Professor of Ocean Sciences and Principal Investigator at the Friedland Friedlander Lab of Biotelemetry 
and Behavioral Ecological Laboratory at the University of California, Santa Cruz. You can see why I'm reading this, can't you? <laughs> Um, he is one of the world's foremost experts on marine mammal behavioral ecology. Ari works on a wide range of ma marine mammal species, including baleen whales, tooth whales, and dolphins. He leads long-term ecological research projects ongoing in Alaska, California, Massachusetts, North Carolina, and Antarctica. I don't know where you were when you were on the, on, the, on the pictures that we saw. And his lab maintains one of the largest marine motion sensing tag databases in the world, some of which are the only recorded kinematic data for many species of Whales. Whales. <laughs> 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 and uh, it's so good to have panelists that help. And we are also very proud to count Ari and his team amongst our keystone partners at the Earth Species Project. So we've got a lot to cover, so I'll dive in with um, just asking not Aza, because we've heard a lot from him, but Ari and Karen in a couple of sentences to tell us about your work, and then we can go into some questions. Mm -hmm. okay. um, hi, my name's Ari. Thank you all for, for coming tonight. Um, I think the, the main goal of my research is to explore the oceans and try to develop new technology and tools to study marine mammals specifically um, so that we can better understand their needs, um, their lifestyle, their culture, uh, and understand a little bit more about the impact that we have on them. And in doing so, think about ways that we can minimize our effect on them by understanding uh, what we do and how it can be uh, negatively impacting these animals, either behaviorally or physiologically or ecology. So my work at the University of British Columbia falls under the umbrella of the Smart Earth Project, an analog to smart cities. We study the ways in which the tools of the digital age might be mobilized to address some of the most pressing problems of the Anthropocene be that biodiversity loss or climate change. Bioacoustics is one incredibly powerful tool within a much bigger toolkit. Uh, that is the topic of the book, The Sound of Life. Um, I'm the non-expert in the room, so I'm looking forward to learning a lot from both of you tonight. But I will say that, that of the, the panoply of innovations out there, and there are many, um, of applying AI to conservation, the Earth Species Project is doing absolutely fabulous work, so yeah. Glad to be here. Thank you, thank you both. And so I'm going to start with that Dr. Doolittle, Doolittle question. Um, you know, we've just heard from ASA about where the tech is, and um, I'm keen to hear from each of you how you far you think that the tech might take us. Not the where we'll be, we will be in 2050, because that's another question, but just, you know, Given how different we are from other species and how different they are from other species, do we expect a dot to do little moment? I mean, the philosophers would say no. Ludwig Wittgenstein was famous for saying, if a lion could speak, we could not understand him. There's a huge debate in philosophy, Thomas Nagel, right? Um, that asserts that uh, humans would be incapable of understanding the language of other species should they possess it. Uh, because our Umwelt, the embodied experience of living and being that creature, in Nagel's case, uh, the paradigmatic bat, right, is so different that even if they had language, we could never understand. I think Nagel's about to be proven wrong, thanks to the work of uh, Earth Species and others, notably because although perhaps our bodies cannot buzz and vibrate like a honeybee or ululate like a whale, our computers and our robots can do just that. So I do think we're, we are gonna have a Dr. Doolittle moment. I, and I will say one more thing. It's likely gonna happen first with charismatic megafauna, whales. It, it, we actually already have broken the interspecies communication barrier with honeybees. We can talk about that in a moment. But sound is such a ubiquitous form of energy and communication via sound is so universal across uh, the tree of life that we're not gonna stop at charismatic megafauna plants. I, I hope we get to, to talk a little bit about plants as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think, Aza, you, you, you touched on this in your, in your introduction that 
the more we understand things like marine mammals, the more we realize they have culture and that they pass on information, not only just between each other and between generations, but over long periods of time. And I think one of the things that draws us um, emotionally to marine mammals is they do a lot of things that are similar to us, right? They have parental care, they're mammals, they, they have these societies and these relationships among individuals that requires some of these kinds of communication that we are probably familiar with. And certainly a whole lot that we're not, but there, there are very likely these, these fundamental ways that animals um, communicate with each other that give us at least the advantage of knowing what we should be looking for, at least for a small segment of their culture. I feel like in the end, this will have moved a whole bunch of unknowns unknowns into the known unknowns and some known knowns. Like that's going to be like the move. Of course, there'll still be unknown unknowns, which is always the most exciting. So Karen, you mentioned the tree of life. What about the application of the technology across the tree of life? And do we think that's a real possibility? It sounds as if you do, Karen. Yeah, so the, the field of bioacoustics has undergone a massive revolution in the past 10 to 15 years because of the miniaturization of digital recording devices, the rapid reduction in price, and the consequent ex explosion of recording of non-humans, all sorts of species. And nearly everywhere scientists and amateurs look, you can go build an audio moth yourself, it's DIY, look it up. You too could be an amateur citizen scientist bioacoustician. Um, when we listen to almost all species, uh, we find that they are in communicating sonically, they're able to make sound, uh, they're sensitive to sound. Now much of this is occurring in the ultrasonic, too high for our naked human ear, or the infrasonic, too low for our naked human ear, and of course humans tend to believe that what we cannot observe does not exist. H however, um, the technology is such that we're, we're now able to document uh, noise making in species we previously thought to be mute, like turtles, proving parental care in turtles. Turtle hatchlings coordinate the moment of their birth before they even begin cracking those eggshells, mm. Amazonian river turtles. It, this is a species I thought until a few years ago to have nothing to say, and it turns out they have actually hundreds of unique vocalizations. I could go on and on. The mother turtles are waiting in the river. Scientists assume the mothers laid the eggs and left. And in fact, the mother turtles are waiting in the river and they're calling to their baby turtles and then they guide them to safety in the flooded forest of the Amazon. So we're, we're, we're overturning some core assumptions about other species farther and farther on the tree, away on the tree of life. And indeed, the plant research, I think, is the stuff that's most fascinating. Um, I'll, t I'll tell one little anecdote about coral, and then I'll stop. Um, so coral larvae are little microscopic blobs. They have no central nervous system. They essentially uh, are a little sac with cilia. They use the cilia to feed and move around. So for as a sort of fishery scientists used to think that coral larvae are simply washed out to sea in these great spawning events that happen on the coral reefs. They float around haplessly and wind and waves and currents might push them back and they would settle randomly on a reef. But recently they've done these great experiments in choice chambers and out um, in the ocean. If you think tracking a whale is hard, try tracking coral larvae. <laughs> <laughs> and what they have found is that coral larvae not only can sense the sound of a healthy reef and distinguish it from a sound of de a degraded reef, they can also sense the sound of their home reef and swim back to that particular reef. They, they somehow imprint sonically on the lullaby when they are born. They are washed out to sea and they swim back home, putting them in the same kind of category as you know, the great salmon migrations or the great bird migrations. So we have no idea how coral larvae, such simple organisms, can do this, but it seems logical to assert that sound is a fundamental form of energy. It, all, all living things are sensate to it. They convey complex information via sound, and so the technologies that are being developed today for whales could potentially be applied to a, a vast range of other species. Ari or Asa? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating what you're saying. And to me, when, as you're talking about that, it makes me think evolutionarily. You know, you talk about whales in 34 million years. Now you're talking about corals that have been around for half a billion years, probably. And 
that acoustics is that important to the to the lives and, and the life history of more than what we know, I think is really profound. And um, I think rather than thinking about it bringing people down to their level, I think more what it does is it elevates other things up to where we think we are, are sentient, you know, and um, my hope is that this kind of knowledge by elevating these these things provides a little bit more of that empathy for conservation that doesn't just exist for you know the big animals that we that we cherish could, could you talk a little bit about the so far channel and like how long distance like the original whale wide web oh yeah so in so um in the ocean uh vertically there is a region um, 800, 1,000 meters deep, pretty deep down, about a half a mile deep down, that because of the physical properties of the water there, the density and the salinity, creates a, a channel that is sort of ubiquitous across uh, ocean basins. And whales, sperm whales, big blue whales and baleen whales, but mostly sperm whales, um, that have very low frequency sounds but are very powerful sounds, go down into this region and when they emit sounds in this region, rather than it scattering through the water column, it basically bounces off the, the margins of this, and it allows that sound to propagate over hundreds and hundreds of miles. And so communication can really be um, exacerbated over scales that we really had no idea about before. And then blue whale calls, um, we've got John Ryan from Mbari who's here, who can speak to this a lot better, but um, blue whale calls, you know, the lowest frequency sounds that are emitted, uh, can be tracked for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Uh, we had some Australian colleagues a few years ago who, as soon as they left Hobart, Australia, started picking up blue whales in the Antarctic yeah. and were able to follow those sounds over literally six, eight hundred miles um, and eventually get to where those animals were um, just because of the magnitude of that sound. And, um, you know, it makes us think the, oce the oceans are big when we're on it, but for those animals that, that use the entire ocean basin, they're actually able to, to turn that into a a living room or a you know a habitat that may not be nearly as large as we as mm -hmm. we think. Chris Clark talks about being in Bermuda and listening to whales off the coast of Ireland. Yeah. They can chat with each other. Yeah. No. Uh, a friend of oh, Tom Mustel, who wrote the, the other book we had up there, How to Speak Whale, has this like beautiful point where he says, um, if you were an alien coming to Earth and you just sort of plop down in a random habitat. Like, what communication would you be most likely to hear? And of course, we would say, like, well, humans. But actually, he's like, the answer is whale. 75% of the Earth's surface is water, but like, what is it? It's like 95% by volume is water. Mm -hmm. the, the whales are communicating across ocean basins. Like, the, the predominant form of communication on this planet is not human, it's cetacean. So we've been talking in a very upbeat way about all the things that we're going to be able to do, but Aza, I want to go back to um, the perils or the problems that we might be encountering, um, picking up from what you talked about. Yeah, I feel like the fundamental paradox of technology is that the better we can understand, the better we can serve and protect, and the better we can exploit. Um, so, you know, if we gain the ability to communicate, you could imagine how poachers might misuse this. Um, or even just ecotourists, tourism groups, like using it to attract animals. Already, I think it's, a, it's banned to use cell phone apps that play bird songs in national parks mm -hmm. because it messes with them. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity because this tech is still in the lab. Um, but with the pace of AI, if it's like in the lab now, it'll be in our cell phones, like all of our cell phones in the next one, like four years. And I, I think I'm sort of hedging a little bit. Um, so I think there's an opportunity now, and it's a rare one, to get out in front of the, sort of like all of these use cases and figure out like, how, how do we assemble like this group, this group, governments to, figure out in what ways is it OK to intervene in a system to protect it? Um, and in what ways is it It's sort of like a prime directive. Like we're about to make, like to, to start intervening in cultures. Like what's the right way of doing that? First, do no harm. Yeah. Well, and then how do we know when we're I doing know. harm without mm -hmm. asking? Um, yeah, you, you brought up the example in your talk of maybe we can 
understand how to tell a whale to dive when a ship is approaching. And I, th I mean, it's a, it's a noble goal, but at the same time, should animals be the ones that are uh, sort of at our whim? Mm. And I would, you know, the counter to that is, why don't we just do things that don't hurt the animals? But there's another option. Are. There's another option. So right now we're using bioacoustics to do what you're suggesting, no, the dive example. So very briefly, some of you might be familiar with the highly endangered population of North Atlantic right whales off the east coast of North America. About 400 individuals left. With the rapidly warming waters off the coast of Maine, that group of whales moved north a few years ago. They essentially are climate change refugees, and they ended up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Abundant food, because this massive freshwater river is pouring into the ocean and generating upwellings of nutrients. Unfortunately, it's like trying to eat lunch on a 12-lane highway, because you've got massive shipping, lots of whale strikes, uh, deaths, and no one knew what to do until a very cool researcher named Kim Davies at the University of New Brunswick put her autonomous drone aquatic gliders into the water. They triangulate the location of the whales. That information is sent in real time to the government, ships captains and fishers, and the ships have to slow down, stop. The f uh, right now, if you detect a, a, a whale sound within a thousand mile radius, you cannot go lobster and crab fishing on mm -hmm. the Canadian side. Fines are $250,000. So. Think about it, this is 400 whales controlling the movements of tens of thousands of ships in a watershed home to 45 million people. And the whale simply has to sing and the ships get out of the way. And that will probably save that population. We're now doing something similar on the west coast of North America, Whale Safe with the Benioff Institute. And they're actually proposing a kind of global regime of these mobile protected areas that are bioacoustics powered. So, so I think there's lots, there's lots we can do with bioacoustics, even without translating language that enables us to protect other species. Absolutely. Thank you. So to my last question, because I did promise an interactive um, event, uh, if we're successful, what might change in the world? Nobody's got an answer. I, I would hope, and I sort of touched on it earlier, that I think um, when I think about conservation, the reason that people, the reason that people do things and what's meaningful to them is the connection that you have to them and the similarities that you find between an animal and a culture and what we do. And that my hope, um, in a maybe a naive sense, is that the more we understand and the more we learn about these animals, it brings not to the people who are already privy to it and understand and believe in it, but to the the other 99% of folks who may not have access to this kind of information and may not understand what culture is in other animal species, and that it becomes something that is much more tangible for a bigger audience so that the, the bottom-up force um, for conservation and protection of the animals and their habitat uh, is something that's a little, little easier um, and not so much of a battle. Hmm. I mean, I could imagine a world like 40 years from now, 30 years from now, we look back and eating meat is a little bit like smoking in the sense that we're like, hmm, and people still do it, but it's just like not really the cool thing. It's sort of gross. Um, I could imagine, you know, like the Blue Planet 3 or 4 being subtitled. Um, I could. I feel like if I'm, if I'm allowed to dream a little bit, it's that even if we could draw down all the carbon tomorrow, which we should do if we could do that, it wouldn't solve the core issue, like the generator function, which is human ego. And that perhaps there's a way that this can be part of a wider movement, because there is no such thing as a silver bullet. Like we're we're in a situations, so you don't solve situations, you navigate them. There's no silver bullet, but maybe there is like silver buckshot. And this is part of a larger shift in the way human beings relate to themselves, and this can help patch human ego. Um, it's a tall order, but also if we're going to survive, we need to do that anyway, so maybe this gets us there faster. I would like to believe this is possible. Um, 
Google produced a really funny spoof video, I think, for April Fool's Day 2019, Google Tulip. Dutch researchers in the spoof video have uh, created a tulip translation mm. device. The tulips can you know, tell the, research, the scientists if they're thirsty or hungry and more. They can actually, they start asking existential questions. What is the meaning of my existence? You know, the scientists are so harried mm. and overwhelmed, they uh, basically, you know, they find the tulips annoying or they don't even want to listen to their existential questions. Um, I say that in half in jest, whole in earnest, because I would really like to think that the technologies you're working on would lead to a rise of empathy. Just in case, I think we need to have a plan B. And plan B is, is, a, is an overhaul of environmental regulation for the 21st century. There were two great problems with environmental regulation in the 20th century, a lack of data. We now have a hyperabundance of data and post hoc reactions. The river is polluted, the fish are dead. If you can find out who did it, maybe you can slap a fine on them, but the fish are dead. Now, with real-time monitoring, we can actually engage in um, predictive, preventive environmental governance. And we have to do that for many, many things, including endangered species. So I, I feel like that is a, the broader agenda in the race against time um, to stop uh, you know, this onslaught of pollution, biodiversity loss, this will also benefit us. I'll just mention one example, which is noise pollution. The ambient levels of noise pollution you all experience moving through this city today are associated with increased stress hormones, cardiovascular risks, heart attacks, stroke, cognitive delays, dementia. People in 50 years will look back and not only say about meat, they'll say about noise, mm. which is a huge problem for human health, but also uh, for non-humans. They're even more vulnerable than we are. So I, I think overhauling noise pollution regulations, integrating noise protection uh, and bioacoustics into environmental regulation as we begin to reinvent environmental governance for the 21st century mm -hmm. is, is where we need to go and hope that the um, seeing self in other, that the empathy also emerges, but yeah. I, I hope the plan A works, but just in case we'll do plan B also. It's making me think <laughs> about um, my octopus teacher, how many people saw that? Oh, yeah. Right, and like the number of people who've come and said to me, like, I've stopped eating octopus mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of that movie. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, it'd be hard to have this conversation without talking about Roger and Katie Payne, yeah. who released Songs of the Humpback Whale. Um, and 1960s, that record, uh, you know, goes on Voyager 1 to represent all of Earth on the golden record, um, creates Star Trek Four go back in time to save the whales, uh, and is played in front of the UN General Assembly and eventually helps catalyze the ban of deep sea whaling. Like There are cases of empathy helping to superpower movements. Um, same thing when you know people were standing on the moon looking back. It's not like just the blue marble and uh, Earthrise images caused the change, but it, like, it did sort of dose Humanity with the overview effect, it's like the first Earth selfie, being like, oh, we are really tiny floating in space. That's all we got. Um, <laughs> and the EPA is born. NOAA comes into existence. Um, Clean Air Acts is passed. Modern Earth Day is born. And that was in the Nixon era. And so what I really love about what you're saying is like those were sort of 20th century regulatory solutions, which are now inadequate for a 21st century environment. And you know, we are the rate of change for technology is going vertical. So that means the externalities, the harms that we do are going vertical at the same time. So it is going to be, I think, with, as you're talking about, like real time monitoring, real time understanding, and then prediction of what those externalities are, that if we have the willpower to care, we will then have the power to protect. I think there's, there's an interesting case. And so 1973, the Endangered Species Act was passed, right? And that was a reactionary measure for that. The year before, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed, which was a proactive piece of legislation. It's in its 50th year anniversary right now. And it's one of the few legislations that said, whales and dolphins have a right to exist and their habitats have a right to be functional. And the burden of proof is effectively not on the animal to be endangered, but it is on humans to show that you basically do no harm. And so at least there are some pieces of legislation that they may not be um, 
utilized and they may not have the, the political weight, but there are some things that are there and I think that's a good example of one where that act was born out of uh, a gentleman going on a, a commercial tuna boat in the eastern tropical Pacific and seeing dolphins that were being killed in these the sets of, of nets around tuna and mm -hmm. just showing and, and taking a video of dolphins getting cut up and cut out of these nets and thrown away was enough of a response or created enough of a groundswell of response to generate federal legislation in, a, in that kind of an era. And so uh, it's, it came about as a bummer, but it does at least give us some hope that these things can, uh, can be proactive as well. Yeah, I mean, Super. just the realization that many, many species have names. Mm -hmm. How many species we study, bats, whales, dolphins, you know, birds, um, birds that, that might be enough. Thank you. I really want to pass the mic to the audience. Uh, Jane and Andrea are out there with a mic, so please put your hand up and, and ask the questions. Uh, hi, uh, great conversations, thank you. My name is Chris and um, I'm just dying, my curiosity is dying to hear from Professor um, Baker about how bees communicate with flowers. <laughs> about honeybees? Honeybees, yes. Okay, well, let's, we, we can do this as a group dialogue. Um, so Aza, in the presentation, mentioned Yossi Yovel's work in Tel Aviv uh, uh, about the interaction between bees and flowers. That paper sparked a debate. There were a whole bunch of research that, research that said, no, it's actually the bees landing on the flowers, that they physically vibrate the flowers. It's not just acoustics. So he designed this very clever experiment to prove that it was simply the sound of buzzing. Um, so, but let's back up just a little bit to just a slightly broader lens. Researchers are now finding out that essentially pollinators and plants have co-evolved. So, Bats are also pollinators. There are many plants in nature that have special shapes that are designed to uh, be very reflective or very attractive to bat echolocation. The, the, the highly tuned acoustic flashlight that bats use to see their world, to sense prey on the move, to find the flowers or the plants they need to pollinate. So, um, so some of these vines or leaves are shaped like cat's eye mirrors in an acoustic sense, or, or, or they absorb a lot, or they reflect a lot, so very clever. So it, it's actually, in a way, marvelous, but maybe quite banal that the pollinator and the plant are having an interaction. What is probably the case, although we haven't yet discovered most of these examples, because we simply haven't looked, is that, um, most flowers will respond to bees in a similar way, um, and most plants that will respond to pollinating bats in a similar way. So honeybees, we, we know, have a, a couple hundred signals. We haven't decoded all of them. We know there's a stop signal. We know there's a waggle dance that tells one bee uses to tell other bees where to go to find a nectar source with great specificity. They can give instructions that send hive mates across literally dozens of miles, and they do that by orienting their bodies to gravity, the position of the sun, because they can see polarized light. Their abdomens, which have six degrees of rotational freedom, um, are communicating very complex information. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we're just at the beginning of doing more complex experiments. Tim Landgraf in Germany has invented these little robo-bees that can go into the hive. It sounds very sci-fi, but um, he, the, the research is fascinating. The robots can go into the hive and, and he's mastered two signals. One is to tell the honeybees to stop. Um, his, his robot can also go in and do a waggle dance and tell them where to go to find a new nectar source they didn't know about. So the next stage of this research is, is going to be answering your question, right? It's gonna be bringing honey, buzzing honeybee robots close to the flowers and trying to say lots of different things like, oh, maybe one signal gets even sweeter nectar. <laughs> right? we, we don't know, we're just at the start. Um, but it's, again, through this marriage of uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, and biology that we're at least now able to ask the questions. Just one other small mind-blowing thing uh, when I was reading about honeybee communication is that there are lots of little furs and hairs on like the legs of honeybees and like their bodies. So when they're dancing and moving, they're actually creating static electricity charge. So it's not just sound that they're communicating in, but electric fields. They yeah. can like feel it on so their So they're bodies. using their, yeah, it's, it's vibrational, it's positional, it's, yeah, it's, they're astounding. 
creatures. So another question, and um, I'm conscious of time, but I want to allow maybe three more questions because um, it's so fascinating, isn't it? It really is. Um, Professor Baker, you mentioned, I'll get your words wrong, but um, the human species has difficulty believing things that we cannot measure. And along the ethical question to all of you, Ari, I believe you mentioned in response to like who's to say that our species is the one that should be guiding this conversation without it being mutual. There are so many things that we don't know about this natural world. There's so many layers that are unknown because we can't measure them. What does this technology, should we be able to create it, what effect does that have on the things that we don't know and how do ethics play a, play a role in that? How are we changing the course of the natural world by affecting things that we don't know <coughs> with the limited amount of awareness that we do know that we're creating this technology off of? So I, I, I don't think there's one answer to that question. I'd no. love to hear from Ari and Aza. In, in the book, um, in my work, uh, so I've been very fortunate to do a lot of work with indigenous communities in northern Canada. In fact, the inspiration for this book came from the work of people like John Burroughs, who, who's an Anishinaabe legal scholar, who tells of a time when colonial settlers came to North America, and the, the, the animals and the plants and the animate beings, some of which are rocks and mountains, fell silent. Now, we can treat that as mere my mythology, right? We can treat that as sort of um, storytelling. And there's a long to be, to be had about indigenous uh, knowledge. <laughs> but setting that aside, um, there, uh, I've had many experiences where indigenous communities know things that Western scientists laboriously reprove. And what, from an indigenous perspective, deep listening provides ethical guideposts because it should only be done in a context where people have a commitment and uh, a lived relationship to place. Um, they don't believe that data is f free or available to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, they think if you were to treat non-humans as legal persons, well, non-human persons should have the right to their own data. Um, ethics protocols that apply to humans, like consent, and then the whole question of indigenous data sovereignty, because right now we harvest a lot of data from all sorts of territories, um, of which indigenous peoples are stewards, and um, that data under some legal frameworks is actually theirs. It's not just there for the taking, it's not there for appropriating. So all these questions about data, privacy, the relationship to the land, and whether we are going to engage in a technologically enhanced form of eavesdropping, or whether we are in some kind of dialogue that comes, as Aza said, with responsibilities. So I think by convening the conversation between deep listening and digital listening, we can have very constructive dialogues that, about your question, which I haven't answered, but I think <laughs> perhaps that now there's, I've sketched a, 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 a richer dialogue that could happen to start to answer those questions. I don't know if you want to add anything. Oh, I want to make sure, Ari. Yeah, I, it's a fabulous question. It's, it's, it's hard to answer off the top of your head for sure, but um, I think one of the other things that the opportunity we have now, and you sort of touched on this with indigenous cultures, is that through all of what we do, we have definitely lost place with nature. And the opportunity that I see here is for us to become maybe more indigenous in a way, that the more we are understanding, the more we can have a capacity to be more part of the system because we know more, just like an indigenous culture, knows everything about the animals and the plants that they, that they require and that they need to have that relationship in order to survive. We artificially can survive very nicely. And I was talking with somebody earlier about, you know, they said, what's the Antarctic like? You know, and to me, it's one of these great examples of, that's not a place where people are supposed to live or be able to thrive, right? But there are places where we should. And, having a connection and feeling like you are more part of a system, I think is one of the positives and uh, something that could be um, what comes from the technology in, in a positive, and it's obviously a little naive, but I think it is, it's a parallel to what you were, you were mentioning. Next question. Hi, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering if we could reach out the limits of that, all those systems. Uh, so let me expand that on a little bit. 
Um, first, I'm thinking of AI. AI are learning what we are giving them to learn from. They're limited by the information we're giving them to, to teach, to learn from. So thinking back at the Umwelt, right, and the way that we are seeing the world through our eyes, through our ears and everything, right? So for microphone, we can go lower frequencies, higher frequencies, so we can expand that Umwelt a little bit, but there are definitely some dark spots there that we will never know or which by chance, who knows. So how do we take that into account? And then to train AI, we need a lot of data, like really a lot of data. Do we have that? And then what about the computation power that we need to do those calculations? Do we actually can reach that power? Do we have enough energy to do all of that? I'll say from my perspective, the, the great part about that is that what you just sort of laid out, I think, is exactly what Earth species has been able to sort of put out as, as a roadmap. That, that I, as an explorer, as someone who goes out and collects data, I now have an opportunity to do that for a cause outside of just my, my little, you know, teeny grant that I've got or whatever. And that there is the computational horsepower and brain power to be able to take advantage of that. And I think there's probably been a bit of a, a mismatch in where these two camps are scientifically. And I think you, you brought up the idea of data sharing. And now that there is an abund overabundance of data, but connecting it in, in the proper ways with the proper kind of channels has, has been quite limited. And so this is, I mean, it's, it's why I, I am so excited for the opportunity to work with you guys is because there's now this kind of bridge in that, in that capacity. Yeah, I think. <laughs> To the extent that, that we can help, it's that there's a lot of data. There are, Ari is, is one, but uh, this huge numbers of researchers have poured their soul into going out and observing and being with these animals. And being in the field, it's really the hard then to also stay up to date with the latest machine learning. I mean, it's almost impossible to stay up to date with machine learning if that's all you do. Um, so to get to help be some of those bridge builders and then bridge walkers and to take what is normally like silo data and help put it together um, is, I think, part of the work that, that we get to do being not of academia, not being of a, like technology exactly. We get to like be this. I almost think of it as like our, our goal is to be the mycelial net of like these fields, because when you can connect them, like incredible amounts of nutrition can flow. So last question, briefly, please. Um, I'm mind boggled by your presentation today. And so kind of a two pronged question. One, we live in a very fractured world where coordination and uh, regulation, et cetera, is becoming increasingly impossible and sort of short term economic incentives prevail. Sort of like, how do you incentivize coordination and collaboration and capital flow to this. Um, could, uh, are you guys planning on open sourcing your data so that way researchers like us, oh, I'm part of Orca Sound, where we're doing that for southern resident killer whales, um, can take advantage of that work, especially on the data side? Was that one directed at me or at Ari? Uh, everything we do is, is open source and is, is is trying to give back the data. Um, well, it's not owned by us. It's it, like it's the researchers, and to the extent that the researchers are open, as Ari is to like opening up the data, then we do too. And our hope is that there's a flywheel that, as you can start to see benefit from the models that we are developing, which are open source, that we're going to work very hard to make easily accessible, that can accelerate in the same way that the field of NLP and human understanding has really accelerated um, in the last four years, that same kind of acceleration can start happening in ecology and ethology. And then that can accelerate conservation impact. When you can see that happening, then there's an incentive to share that data, because you get back better models to use in your own work, and you get to see it impacting the animals that you care so much about, that there can be a shift in the culture of data sharing. And then you know, Bill Joy has this wonderful quote about like why open source matters. And he says, 
no matter where you work, the majority of the smartest people work somewhere else. <laughs> and it's the, all of those people I think we want to be able to participate um, because, as you say, there, there isn't much time. Uh, and often it is access and uh, that is holding us back. I just want to go back to Natalia's question about this fractured world in which we live and the possibility of doing something globally um, in terms of the governance issues or just generally maybe the scientific community are much better at cooperating. I th isn't that your job, Kay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I will say if you look back to your point about that generation of regulations and legislation, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, when those were passed, let us not forget, rivers were so polluted in North America, they would spontaneously combust. <laughs> we lived in a filthy, like, so, you know, the pollu pollution in the industrial a age got to a very, very low point before a whole generation of environmental regulations turned it around. We're still playing catch up with, the, you know, these new classes of pollutants. But um, I think it's important to retain um, a sort of sense of pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will about this. Certainly the EU is leading with its digital green agenda and has shown, I think, leadership uh, with respect to uh, intertwining digital transformation and sustainability transformation. So on the, on the governance front, I'm actually relatively optimistic. Um, I think the scientific front is a, a little um, actually more challenging because of the, of the siloing of data, the disciplinary boundaries and turf wars, to be honest, you're not like that. Um, so, so that's why it's so great to have groups like Earth Species who are sort of independent brokers and who provide that backbone and that sort of missing link that can really be game changing. And then, you know, we sort of live in an age of multipolar traps that if we don't do it, somebody else will, like tragedy of the commons, like what's good for me is bad for everyone, but I see a bottleneck coming, so I'm gonna keep doing the thing that's good for me because then I'll come out better than you on the other side. Like, that's, that's real. Um, and, you know, the, if you look at the 17 SDG goals, there's one that's missing, and if we have that one, we can have a chance of getting the others, and if we don't have that one, We'll never get all the others, and that is the ability to do social coordination at scale, which is why the other hat I wear is Center for Humane Technology, and it's trying to figure out like how do we articulate and become a culture that is aware of, say, multipolar traps and tragedy of the commons. That's just like the language we speak, because if we can, if we can't do that, we're constantly going to run into these race conditions and like race for dominance. If we can become aware, then that gives us a language by which we can say, if we don't solve those problems, like there isn't going to be a world for us to live in. And I think that means we can all be on the same side of the table, and that opens up the possibility for these, uh, for these other interventions to work. The, so like the most hopeful and least hopeful thing I know in one is that if a system can't continue, then at some point, it won't. Um, so I, I feel that there is a rite of passage coming for humanity. We're sort of in it right now. Where the rite of passage is where you face death in some way, some part of your identity you have to let go, it, it dies, so that you can adopt that new identity and emerge with your power matched with your responsibility or maturity. And the next 30 years are gonna be super hard. And the question is how do we as a species show up to that? And like, what are the myths and stories, the myth of poetics we tell ourselves, so that as we show up to those challenges, we can become the species that survives and helps the rest of the planet thrive with us. Ari, I'll give you the final word. Thanks. Um, I kind of like to think about data shaming, to be honest, as a scientist, <laughs> and that what I want my colleagues to see is that if you're, you know, in academics, you you make such a big deal out of everything because you have so little, right? <laughs> and so what I, my hope is, is that the example that our lab and our colleagues said is that you gain so much more by allowing your data to be open and to let 
other disciplines and other people who are way smarter than you take advantage of it and tell you how good it can be and what it's useful for. And hopefully the metrics that spin back from that, whether it's papers or grants or whatever the metric is, people will eventually see that and realize if I stay in my own little silo, like I'm, I'm obsolete, you know? The other thing I wanted to mention is that we just published a, a really interesting report with the World Wildlife Fund called Blue Corridors. And we took mm -hmm. tracking data from thousands of whales, you know, that have been studied around the world and showed where the big corridors are that these animals move through. And the most sort of enlightening thing is that, you know, a humpback whale that's feeding in the Antarctic and that breeds in Colombia or Panama passes through the jurisdictional waters of seven or eight different countries. And you made this point about right whales could potentially be limited in their ship strikes in Canada and by having this new technology. And that's great, but those animals go to Jacksonville, Florida to give birth. And if the US and that other country isn't willing to kind of play ball, you're sort of at that lowest common denominator of conservation. And if it's guilt, whether it's getting on board or, or shaming or whatever, whatever it is, letting people recognize that you know, these animals are utilizing their waters and that it, if you wanna protect them and save them, you need to collaborate. You need to have things that are gonna be common between countries in how you either think about animals, think about the planet, or, or think about the actions of humans. The perfect note to end on. Please um, join me in thanking our wonderful panel.